I am an artist and I make stuff. And I have a firm belief that if we listen to the objects that surround us, we'd have a much better chance at solving some crucial contemporary issues. Could I get a, a podium or something? I just need something. Um, <clears throat> I grew up somewhere in rural America, it doesn't really matter where. It was a place where words like dissonance and innovation were not used. If they were, they were misunderstood on purpose. There was a high level of interaction with things. If you wanted a ladder, you'd make one. If you needed a log, and yes, it was the sort of place where one needs a log, you'd cut down a tree. Important interactions were most often between yourself and the world of things. This instilled in me an unconditional love for making. When asked about childhood adventures, many people will think of games on a playground or building blanket forts in the living room. My childhood was a little different. I remember collecting lead weights just to melt them down over a fire in our driveway. I'd splash the molten metal across the ground just to see what shape it would freeze into. Or making tiny stoves out of wet clay. Essentially smaller versions of the ones in our house. I was determined that they would fire themselves when lit and I'd try again and again when they crumbled to pieces. Being raised here gave me an understanding of a world outside the daily news cycle or uh, undue pressures of socializing. At the time, I couldn't tell you the difference between a Republican and a Democrat or who Andy Warhol was, but useful or not, I could take apart and reassemble a lawnmower engine in minutes. <laughs> Out of this, I became an artist, an artist steeped in a world of stuff. Eventually, I moved on to what was called the big city for art school. I fell in with a group of artists as passionate about making as I was. We would use just about anything to create and build. Desks, bookshelves, even an old ladder would become material for our next project. It was an exhilarating time for us, and we were somehow convinced that the things we made had the power to change the world. But here at school, there was a component that I was utterly unfamiliar with, discourse. We were asked to talk about the things we made in an endless stream of discussions, critiques, and artist statements. Now, I think artists often lift up their work with language to explain things that might not be there, but I had the opposite problem. I couldn't talk about what was there. I found it incredibly frustrating and it became a cloud over my entire school experience. Once a student brought a fresh roadkill squirrel into the studio, and he wanted to skin it for its pelt. And yes, fresh is a relative term when it comes to roadkill. A group gathered, and there were discussions about how to do it. I, uh, there were people trying to find a resource that might give a step-by-step. -step. And I, I, of course, knew how to skin a squirrel. <laughs> but I was too embarrassed to admit it. <laughs> it was somehow more acceptable to discuss and hypothesize than to actually do. Discussion legitimized the process, while our, where an actual interaction was somehow less acceptable. I didn't realize it then, but this relationship between squirrel and process, or more TED-like language and objects, came to define my approach to art. You see, I think it's important to listen to what things have to say, and sometimes it's not so clear as a televised statement. If you're willing to really pay attention, you can learn more from an object than the person standing next to it. After school, I began to show my work more and more. 
and I was invited to show in museums, and I've had a steady career creating large-scale sculptures. But I quickly found that the pressures to explain and discuss my artwork were more present than ever before. I was asked to participate in panel discussions, artist talks, to write press releases and artist statements. It is a seemingly infinite stream of verbal and verbose engagements. I confronted this the only way I knew how, as an artist. During the past 15 years, while maintaining my career as an object maker, I have also explored different ways of presenting my work through performance. I began by simply altering books. In this piece called Kant and My Truck, I made a wrench entirely from Immanuel Kant's critique of judgment. Then I tried to fix my truck with it. <laughs> I wanted to see how Kant's critique of judgment would hold up in the real world. It turns out, not so well. There we go. This work confirmed to me that I could blur the line between language and the things I make, and the text that defines it. But I wanted to face this relationship in my world. So I staged a series of live performances. In this piece, ha, I gave an artist talk with images of many of my favorite works by other artists as if they were mine. <laughs> In the second piece, I took that idea a step farther. I gave a talk while strolling through a group show at a local museum. I presented all the work there as if it were my own solo show, <laughs> and I described my supposed experimentation with a variety of materials and approaches. At this point, I had developed a body of work that confronted this divide between language and objects in my own life. But I began to see the same problems in the larger world. Every day, you hear stories about self-driving cars or the development of smart objects. Each of these can be a positive step forward for technology, but they also represent a step away from the actual world around us. I, recognizing this growing separation, I wanted to stage a, an interaction that would embody a synergy between language and the things I make. In order to do this, I needed some remove. One day, a solution occurred to me while I was preparing for a public talk. What if I switched roles and had someone else be me? I approached a friend, an actor, and I asked him if he would stand in at a few events as me. Our first performance was an artist talk that included two of me arguing about the meaning of my work. <laughs> he would claim that one sculpture referenced Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion construction. I would interrupt and say it was actually about the formal presence of cast iron and its relationship to our body. It was both, really. I then began to send my proxy to openings, <laughs> studio visits, even dinners, as me. <laughs> there were often hurdles, uh, like the opening where he met a friend of 20 years who knew more about my work than he did. Often he was forced to make things up on the fly. Once he engaged in a heated argument with a critic, 
just to find out about halfway through that Bauhaus was more than just an early 80s band. <laughs> For me, these were small trade-offs. If anything, he's more well-spoken than I am, and he doesn't clam up in crowds like I do. But most importantly, by separating talking from making, we were able to pose a conversation between the two. After a few years, we decided to patch together a contract for his work. I consider this a project in itself. We set up basic terms for things like uh, scope of work, codes of conduct, terms of service. The result is a 50-page document that covers a myriad of circumstance. Uh, for example, page 23, Article 2.9 covers one-time speaking engagements for things like uh, artist talks and TED talks. We are now slowly moving forward, paying close attention to the results and what they can teach us. This allows me to carefully examine where I stand as an artist in relationship to my work. The irony is that it took a contractual separation to fully explore this connection. This body of work taught me that the importance of objects lies in their potential and their ability to speak if we let them. A desk is only a desk if we restrict its voice. And a bookshelf can do a lot more than hold books if you give it the chance. Of course, you might not care if you can use a bookshelf for a table, or if you can fix your own lawnmower. But I would argue that trusting objects and what they have to say can lead us to new discoveries on a much larger scale. If we could just realize the direct connection between intolerance, war, climate change, and our actual everyday lives, Maybe we could generate some more working solutions rather than just compounding these problems into only more talk. What if we took a minute to explore our physical surroundings and tried to create or build something new? Make a ladder. This would empower all of us and foster creativity. And at the same time, we would be actually changing something about the world beyond the mere scope of linguists. And sometimes, just sometimes, it is actually helpful to know how to skin a dead squirrel. <laughs> and if you haven't figured it out by now, I am not Aaron T. Stephan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>